Well, I'm here with famed trends forecaster Gerald Sawanti from Kingston, New York. And uh, I'm looking at his trends journal for the summer edition right here. And inside is quite an extensive article entitled The Last World War, Telling the Truth, No Place for Peace on the World Stage. Now, Gerald, for quite a while now, you've been saying the drums of war continue to beat louder and louder. And you see that continuing. Oh, yeah. Look what's going on in Ukraine, for example. It's heating up over there again. Take a look at the Middle East. You know, we don't get the news at all about what's going on in Yemen. In the United States, matter of fact, under Obama, he sent, sold the Saudis more weapons than any other president. And they're slaughtering innocent people throughout Yemen, well over 10,000 dead over 400,000 dead in Syria. The Iraq war continues on unabated. The Afghan war continues. There's war in Sudan. Uh, you're, you're going throughout much of Africa between Ethiopia and Eritrea. It's heating up. No, the war drums are beating louder and louder, particularly as economies get worse and worse. I've so noticed. it's not only... I've noticed what hasn't been reported very much at all by mainstream media is what's going on with Ukraine and the encirclement of Russia by NATO and Russia's response to that. Now, Putin is being depicted as a new Hitler. He's being demonized in much of the mainstream media. But uh, you and other uh, analysts such as uh, Paul Craig Roberts say that it's just the reverse. We're the provokers, we're the aggressors and we're putting Putin in a box and he has to respond. Do you see it that way? Absolutely. And, and for example, every time they report virtually uh, about Putin and talking about what's going on in Ukraine or about him, they say that, it, listen to Hillary Clinton, her words, that Putin invaded and occupied Crimea. I didn't know that. Crimea was part of Russia longer than America's been a country. And they've been there at that port, in, in that warm water port, you know, for a couple of hundred years. And they cut a deal with, after they gave, actually what happened was uh, Nikita Khrushchev was Ukrainian. And he gave that area back to Ukraine, but he really didn't give them anything. It was under the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union broke up, of course, Ukraine, you know, went their own way. And they made the deal that, Crimea would, the port that the Russians would continue to use it. So the Russians were there, they did not invade, and they had a vote. They had a vote that was internationally monitored, and the people of Crimea voted 96% to stay, to go with Russia rather than to go with Ukraine. So he didn't invade it nor occupy it. It was they were there. And the other thing, and again, you mentioned Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, and I would encourage anyone that's really interested in hearing something that they've never heard before to go to our website, trendsresearch.com, trendsresearch.com, and consider purchasing the video. A year ago, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts was at our uh, Occupy Peace Conference, and he was, for those that don't know, the Assistant Treasury Secretary under Ronald Reagan. And he had the power and used it to bring in the director of the CIA and question him under oath during the Reagan administration. Because the economists such as him and Stockman and others knew that the information coming from the CIA regarding what they were saying was Russia's massive military buildup was untrue because they knew that Russia didn't have the money. I'm mentioning this because what Dr. Paul Craig Roberts makes very clear, and it's not being reported at all in the media today as they demonize Russia, is that the deal was simply this. Number one, that Ronald Reagan did not want to win the Cold War. He wanted to end it. And he got a lot of pressure from the neocons not to end it. Number two, the deal cut and then finalized under George Bush Sr. was that Russia would give back Eastern Germany to Germany and in return 
NATO would not expand any further than it was. Yeah, and George now, Bush Sr. kept that promise. Bill Clinton broke it. George Bush broke it. Obama broke it. And now they're doing troop maneuvers on Russia's borders at the tune of over 40,000 troops. In fact, uh, there's some people that make the comparison, those who are old enough to remember it, uh, the, when uh, Khrushchev brought nuclear missiles into Cuba, the U.S. was ready to go to nuclear war. We consider that an existential threat. Now it's reversed with Russia being encircled by NATO. Do you see it that way? Absolutely, and you mentioned the missiles. How about the missile systems that the United States has installed in Romania and are now putting into Poland? And this is how arrogant they are in the United States and talk to everybody as though we are as stupid as they are. The reason they're putting those missile systems there, folks, is because the Iranians may have missiles and they have to protect Europe from them. That's the cheap line they're throwing out. But again, hey, they throw cheap lines out all the time and start wars. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and ties to al-Qaeda. Yeah, you remember that one. How about the Gulf of Tonkin incident that started the Vietnam War that never happened? Yeah. Well, also, there was a role played by Victoria Nguyen uh, that a lot of people are still unaware of. Yes, anybody if wants to see it, they can go to YouTube, put in the name Victoria Newland and uh, Washington Press Club. I think it was December, I think it was 2013. And there she is at the Washington Press Club bragging that the United States has spent $5 billion of our money. Hey, you folks, you can't drink the water over there in Flint? Yeah, because they're giving our money away to other countries to overthrow them. They gave $5 billion to NGOs in Ukraine to overthrow the democratically elected government of Yanukovych, whether you liked him or not. And Victoria Nuland brags at this meeting that she just came back from Ukraine where she was passing out cookies and candy along with John McCain to the demonstrators at Median uh, Square over there. And that... The future of Ukraine was with Europe, not with Russia, and they, quote, should follow the path set forth by the IMF. So this is the United States-inspired coup of a democratically elected government, whether you like them or not, and now they're in, the Ukraine now is in much worse shape than they were before the United States and its European allies overthrew the government. New and others are considered part of the neocon group in the White House. A lot of people still don't understand what that is. Could you review that for us? Well, when you look at her husband, for example, Kagan, Newland's husband, he's, he's a bit of a, a architect in his family of the American hegemony throughout the world and that America should control the world through military might. And these are the people that gave us the Iraq War, the Afghan War. They're the ones, you know, people forget this, that under Bill Clinton, he was bombing Iraq on a, um, four times a week. He had no fly zones, put on, put on um, uh, sanctions that killed, according to the United Nations, over 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five. Again, anyone could go to YouTube, put in the name Madeleine Albright, or not all that bright, and Leslie Stahl, CBS, 60 Minutes. Put it in, and you'll come up with Leslie Stahl asking Madeleine Albright, of course, was the Secretary of State under Bill Clinton, if the price of 500,000 Iraqi children under the age of five was worth the sanctions. An arrogant psychopath, Madeleine Albright, said, yes, it was. Hey, as long as it's not her kids, you know? Yeah, well, a lot of uh, people still don't understand how the neocons came about. Now, 
Supposedly, Bush Sr., when he was president, uh, kept them at bay in the basement, didn't let them out. Then along came his uh, son, along came Clinton, along came Obama, and they were given full reign of State Department policy in the Mideast, hence all these wars and all this uh, thrust at destabilization. Yes, and also when you hear Paul Craig Roberts uh, uh, talk at our conference, he said that um, one of the reasons, and he makes it very clear, he said one of the reasons why Reagan went into Nicaragua and Grenada, that was a bone to throw the pressure that he was getting from the neocons. They didn't want him to have a deal with Gorbachev. And, and Craig Roberts says, you know, I'm not saying it was right or wrong. He says, I'm just telling you what, what, what was going on at the time. These are sick people. You know, it goes back to the Dulles brothers, you know, after World War II with the CIA and the Cold War and then the Korean War. You have sick people and nobody wants to call them what they are. They rather call them secretaries of states and presidents rather than psychopaths and mad men and mad women. Again, mm -hmm. look at the video clip. And again, these are all there for anyone to see. When they asked Hillary Clinton, who, by the way, was a chief architect, along with Samantha Powers and Susan Rice, to overthrow Gaddafi in the, in the most prosperous nation in Africa, uh, uh, Libya. And they asked her how she felt when she found out that Gaddafi was dead. And she goes like this. We came, we saw, he died. He, <laughs> hey, said, where's the, where's the, where, where are the people with the... You know, with the straitjacket to throw her into a mental institution. Yeah, in fact, um, people talk about the difference between that kind of uh, celebration of a brutal death, an assassination, actually, with uh, the reaction from leaders during the Second World War, as brutal as the Japanese were and the Germans. You didn't have Eisenhower as a general or later as president. You didn't have Truman. You didn't have Roosevelt talking gleefully and maliciously about the enemy. They had dignity when they talked about the necessity of certain actions rather than celebrating it as a joke. Yeah, that's, you, the, the word that you used is, is, is one that's missing from the American vocabulary at so many different levels. Dignity. And then, of course, you mentioned Eisenhower, five-star general, supreme commander of the Allied forces, two-term president, his farewell address, the warning the Americans that the military-industrial complex was robbing the nation of the genius of the scientists, the sweat of the laborers, and the future of the children. Here we are. And I have to tell you, Larry, I am sick and tired of this military mindset. Just to put it into perspective, the military has not won a war since World War II. They killed over three million people in Vietnam under the line that if only you let us bomb some more, we would have won. They had freedom to do anything they wanted to with Iraq and they lost. Afghanistan, the same thing. Now into Syria. Look what they did in Libya. They have a track record of total failure. No one that works for a living could get away with a string of failures like that and keep getting promoted and getting more money to launch more losing ventures. You know, we should, uh, by the way, say that neocon stands for neoconservatives, the new conservatives. They also adhere to a, a concept or perhaps a delusion of a limited war. Now, apparently some of them feel that we could wage a limited war, even a limited nuclear exchange, which would be regional and not uh, blossom into something much worse. Apparently, uh, there are some of that mindset where they actually think uh, nuclear war could stay limited. Look at who these people are. Look at their faces. Look at a Wolfowitz. Look at a Kagan. These are not men. They're little sick boys. Look at Dick Cheney. Or I should be proper on your, I don't want to get you, you know, off the air. Penis Cheney. 
Look at this guy. There's not a man among them. They're sick people, delusional. Who in their right mind would make a comment like that? Oh, you're gonna bomb, you're gonna take out Russia? You know, I have someone uh, gave me a famous chart of Napoleon's march to Moscow, leaving Poland with 423,000 men and coming back with 10,000. There's that, how about Hitler? Launches the greatest military offensive in world history and he loses against the Russians. You're not gonna beat the Russians. You don't poke the Russian bear. These are sick people, the neocons, with sick agendas and destructive not only to the nation, but to the world. Well, what about now the developments of uh, Russia and China forming an alliance, largely as a uh, reaction to um, what we've been doing with Russia and NATO, and also the uh, problem in the South China Sea? Now, apparently the result of the neocon policy is to encourage or at least uh, to result in an alliance that doesn't for, doesn't bode well for the U.S. Well, again, when you mentioned China, look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership being pushed by Obama. It leaves China out of it. And again, there's that anti-Chinese, we keep hearing it all the time. You know, that China's building these, you know, military bases on little specks of land in the South China Sea. And America is now going to protect freedom of navigation. I'm sure you've heard of all the Chinese problems with freedom of navigation. Of course, there haven't been any. There have been some territorial disputes in the area. Number one, it's none of our business. I just believe in what Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, and all the rest said of the founding fathers, no foreign entanglements. You lost everywhere else, and now you're going to fix it in the South China Sea. So yes, the alliance between Russia and China is real, because they see what NATO is doing and how the United States is pushing more and more with its pivot to Asia. Very interesting, however, with the new president of the Philippines. And under the old one, Aquino, they made a deal where the United States was bringing back troops there and bases. And now Duterte, the new president, you saw what he called Obama. He called him a son of a whore. And he also said that, you know, we're not your, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're not going to rule us anymore. And, you know, he went back to the colonialism days when the United States overtook the Philippines. So now Duterte is making more and more um, agreements with China. So it's not even only the United States. You're going to start seeing more and more blowback in that area. And here's the reason why. The business of the world is business. Duterte knows that he has to do business with China. They're his neighbor. And they're an opportunity for him. The same thing with Russia. They're selling China oil. The business of America has become war. You saw the numbers that just came out this past week. Since 2001, the United States has spent $5 trillion since the war on terror began to fight that losing war. Could you imagine if that money was invested in America in our third world infrastructure and our rotten education system where we pay so much money and when you look at the standards we don't even win place or show compared to other OECD nations. So, but Jero, what about the argument that China is obviously building military bases, airstrips, even on tiny islands there's still airstrips, there's still military bases and what they're uh, planning to do is control those sea lanes which means that they control the economic passage of trillions of dollars worth of goods. I mean, isn't that a threat to us legitimately? No, because they haven't done anything of the sort. 
to stop free shipping through there. And why would they? Considering, I mean, China, you know, it, it, China consumes some 40% of the world's natural resources from copper, nickel, iron ore. They want to do business. They're not looking to isolate themselves from the rest of the world. They Why got the military that. bases? What? Why the military bases? Well, whatever reasons they're putting them out there, they're not going to control the South China Sea and, and, and stop passage. It's a fight between them and their neighbors into who owns these atolls and their tiny little bases. And look, you want to talk about China putting a couple of bases in the South China Sea? How many military bases does America have around the world? It's over a thousand. So they're putting a couple of little landing strips on little specks of, of islands out there. And the United States is claiming that they're going to restrict navigation through it. There's no proof at all. Any more so than and less so that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al-Qaeda. So you feel that too is a manufactured crisis that threatens the South China Sea? Absolutely manufactured. By their deeds you shall know them. What have they done? Again, there's disputes with Vietnam, with, with Malaysia, Singapore, and other nations around there. So, you know, but why would China want to... China has to sell their stuff. If they don't sell stuff, they... You know, they're not going to make any money. And they have a billion point two people that they have to worry about because that's China's greatest threat, by the way, are its own people. You know, they used to report, Larry, they stopped doing it. There were about 40,000, 40,000 disruptions in China, civil disruptions a year from people throughout the region, throughout the country, complaining about wages, about income, about on and on and on. China has to keep its people quiet. They need to do business. Considering the economy worsening despite the glowing government reports, which many economists do not believe, including yourself, uh, considering the worsening economy, uh, you're fond of saying when all else fails, they take you to war. So do you see this as a real possibility that we will soon be at war with China, Russia, or both? I don't think we will be at war with Russia or China, because if we do, it will be the war that when they asked Albert Einstein what weapons will be used to fight the third world war? He said, I don't know, but the fourth will be fought with sticks and stones. The wars that they're going to take us into are going to be more wars on terror. As a matter of fact, I would not be surprised if there is something of a geopolitical incident, be it false flag or real, under the, ter under the term of terror, the terminology of terror that happens between now and the general election, the presidential election in November. It will get the people's mind off what's going on. Now let's, you mentioned about the economy. Here are the facts. Our GDP in 2016 has grown at the grand total of 1%. That's no growth at all. You look at the service sector, down. You saw the retail numbers that just came out for August, down 0.3%. Manufacturing index, down. The facts are there. The only thing that's making it look like a recovery is all of that cheap money that they, has enriched the stock markets through stock buybacks and mergers and acquisition activity. So, no war with Russia and China, but more wars in the Mideast and more destabilization of that area. Yes, and also when I talk about no outward fighting of war with China or Russia, that does not mean that there won't be more military buildups. That doesn't mean that they won't be more, there's going to, we believe that Ukraine is, is ready to explode at any moment. Again, 
go back and we used to we do it on we we have a whole clip they put up on um, our our uh, editor uh, uh, put up on um, Ryan Lennox on Trends in the News of what I was saying throughout the Ukraine war when it was going on how the United States and Europe kept claiming that Russia was bringing in troops and armaments into Ukraine. And we would make a joke of it in showing toy trucks and tanks going into Ukraine and saying, how come they can't show us photos of this? How come, I mean, you got photos of everything. We have all of this satellite, you know, we have all of this capability to see, you know, a tiny speck on the earth and you can't show me one. And the photos that they did end up showing were fake. So what I'm saying is, yes, there will be a war of sorts, but not with, with Russia when Ukraine explodes, but we won't be fighting them. We'll All fight right, them but with Ukraine. the continued expansion of NATO, encroaching on Russia, with the continued building of military bases, uh, missiles coming in, Russia will not respond in some drastic way. So there won't be a war with Russia? I don't believe... The, the war with Russia is going to be fought with Ukraine. That's what I'm trying to say. It won't be an outward war. The United States versus Russia will use a proxy. And Ukraine is that proxy. So it won't result in an escalation into something much bigger. Once it's it can it can well explode out of control because you can't control these things. And again, you have midget minds that are running these operations that have no victories at all. And Ukraine is in terrible economic shape now. It's, it's already heating up again. Go, all things are connected as we look at it in trend forecasting, the system as we call it. Look at the G20 meeting that just transpired two weeks ago. The major topic they're talking about are the populist movements throughout Europe. So it's not only the United States where there's discontent, and that's why you have someone like Trump, who's a pop populist, playing into the discontent of the people. You have real populists over there with the AFD party in Germany. You with the five-star movement in Italy, in Austria, and on and on. I'm saying this because you're going to see Europe supporting Ukraine because they also have the problems of their economies going down and getting the people's minds off the problems. So Ukraine will be the proxy for the war against Russia. I know you're not a fan of either of the uh, two candidates, Trump or Clinton. However, Trump seems more inclined to make deals rather than war. Make deals, not war. If he does become president, do you see that as a significant um, change in the direction he, we're heading? If he didn't speak out of both sides of his mouth, I would believe it. Because on one hand, he says he wants to do deals. And on the other hand, he says, I'm going to make the military so big, nobody's going to mess with us. Who are you talking to? What am I, six years old? Are you, are you going to make the military bigger? What are we spending more money than the first seven nations, the sp top spenders combined? So when he says stupid things like that, I lost, I, I, you know, it doesn't make sense. And then, and, and, and then you look at his quotes over the year about, you know, I really like wars, stupid things like that. And again, the support of Israel, you know, the more we're spending, what, $38 billion now to give them money to fight wars over there between, you know, the Palestinians, the problems they're having in Lebanon, and he wants to support even more of that. So, you know, he's picking and choosing his fights, but it's still the same fight as I see it. So you don't see any change then uh, of uh, foreign policy under Trump? Again, by their you know, deeds you shall know them. And he's talking about building the military even bigger and more aggression. And it's a different kind of aggression. We're going to take their oil. I mean, you go back. Anybody can listen to the clips with Libya. 
Yeah. And he was, you know, he says he was against it. He says he was against Iraq. Those are not true statements. They're lies. Right. But part of that is just uh, what he's giving the public because he knows it plays well with the electorate. But he does seem more inclined to have a realistic view that the business of the world is business and war is a waste and it's much better. It's a win-win situation that both sides gain from making a deal rather than war. Again, if he lives by it, great. But it, when, it, when he came out with his military policy, it was more aggression. And look, he says things like, you know, I'm, I, I, I could outdo waterboarding. You know, I mean, so when, it, when somebody says these kind of things, it's, it's a mixed message to me. Well, wrapping up now, Gerald, uh, you know, you're fond of saying also that um, when people have nothing to lose, they lose it. The economy is bad. The war drums are getting louder. So what's in store generally? I, I think it's very important to take a world view. I mentioned populist. The media, by the way, in America, and even the foreign media, every time they refer to populists, they keep calling them right wing. It has nothing to do with that at all. Again, it ties into the refugee crises. And no one wants to talk about who caused it. Where are the people coming from? Oh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. I wonder why. Can't figure it out. Oh, America and its coalition of the killings destroying these countries, bombing them to, to, and, and supporting so-called moderate rebels. I'm sure you, we see moderate rebels. We know exactly what they look like. So what I'm saying is, is that the populist movement that's going on in Europe is a reflection of what's going to go on over here. The people are losing it here. You're seeing it with the racial divide. You're seeing it more and more with the movement. The pro-Trump movement has its foundation in populism. Populism is going to overtake the conservative movement. You're going to see demonstrations, rallies, and pushbacks against the ruling parties, the so-called ruling elite, at every different level. So, look for more discontent, more uprisings. The only way I see this country coming back is again through peace with prosperity. And again, what we launched a year ago, Occupy Peace, it's the only peace program that I know of with an action plan. Bring home the troops, secure the homeland, rebuild America, and force Congress to vote to go to war, which they have not done since World War II, and a referendum on each state ballot will tell them how to vote. So rather than wasting this money, $5 trillion plus, and a $1 trillion when you put in all the other black ops and other uh, 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 accompanying military expenditures, a $1 trillion a year on the military, to me, none of the candidates are talking about how to really rebuild America. And that's to make us, again, a self-sustaining economy. Gerald Suwanzi, thanks for being with us. Gerald Suwanzi of Kingston, New York, where his headquarters are. Famed trends forecaster. Thanks for the insights. Thank you so much for having me on, Larry, and all the best with On Target. Thank you.